Hello and welcome to the presentation on rest and sleep. So no one can clearly define specific requirements for sleep. Fatigue affects the quality of life and lack of sleep can increase your risk of illness and disease. Physical and emotional health depend on adequate sleep and rest. To help a patient gain needed sleep and rest, you need to understand, one, the nature of sleep, two, the factors influencing it, and three, interventions you can provide to promote sleep and rest. You also need to understand how to promote optimal sleep and rest for yourself. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about those things. These are your learning objectives. Please review them in preparation for class and for the exam. So the circadian rhythm is our biological clock. It's affected by light and temperature and external factors like stress and activities. Melatonin is naturally produced by our bodies. It's the sleep hormone and supports circadian rhythm. Some examples of disruption to the circadian rhythm include jet lag and shift work. Jet lag is fatigue from changing time zones quickly, like when you're flying across several time zones. It causes headaches, irritability, lethargy, or mild disorientation. Interventions can include sunlight in the daytime and melatonin at night to reset the body's clock. Shift work is working differing shifts such as alternating from night shift to day shift. Interventions for this include trying to establish a normal, consistent time to rise and avoiding caffeine or other stimulants which can make insomnia worse or make falling asleep more difficult. Sleep regulation involves a sequence of physiological states maintained by the CNS or central nervous system. One of the most difficult to conceive parts of your brain is a small section identified as the reticular activating system or RAS. This tiny portion of the human brain is about the size of your pinky and it can actually have a major role in the effect of your life in general. The RAS is believed to pay, play a big part in sleep-wake cycles. So how does it work? Well, at any given time during your daily activities, your mind is bombarded with millions of bits of sensorial stimulations from the physical environment where you are. Sound, smells, tastes, sights, and feelings are constantly being downloaded into your system, and your mind needs a way to filter that information. The RAS sits in your brain and acts like a customizable filter and adapts to different situations and reacts instantly. The RAS can be seen kind of like a bouncer at the door of your mind. It decides what gets in or what is thrown out. Your beliefs tell the RAS what's important. Your beliefs make a list of all the information invited to the party and your RAS then acts like a club bouncer letting whoever is on the list in and kicking the rest to the curb. The whole cocktail of neurotransmitters are involved in driving wakefulness and sleep including histamine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and acetylcholine among others. While none of these neurotransmission processes is individually necessary, they all appear to contribute in some way. When you try to fall asleep, the stimulation to the RAS decline. Gradually, the BSR, or bulbar synchronizing region, takes over, causing sleep. You won't wake back up until you finish your normal sleep cycle, or if you're woke up by a stimuli in the environment, kind of like your alarm clock. So there's two types of sleep. We have non-REM and REM. Non-REM sleep is non-rapid eye movement sleep. Non-REM makes up 75% of a night's sleep time and is divided into specific stages, which are N1 through N4. People who have difficulty falling asleep, which is called sleep latency, stay in non-REM stage 1 for an hour or more instead of the normal 10 to 30 minutes. Non-REM stage 4 is the deepest level of sleep. The person is very difficult to arouse, vital signs are lower, and sleepwalking and enuresis sometimes occur. Remember, enuresis is bedwetting. During the deep stages of non-REM sleep, the body repairs and regrows tissues, builds bone and muscle, and strengthens the immune system. For rapid eye movement, this makes up about 25% of sleep time and it's at the end of the sleep cycle, usually about 90 minutes after you've fallen asleep. It's a time of increased brain activity and rapid eye movements. Dreaming and memory storage happens during REM sleep. So which of the two are more important for you to feel rested? Well, you need deep sleep to feel rested, so non-REM sleep is best for this, since non-REM stage 4 is when the deep sleep happens. So a lifespan consideration is that as you get older, you sleep lighter and get less sleep. So what implications do you think this has? Well, a lack of REM sleep leads to lack of memory retention. 
less deep sleep prevents the body from fully repairing itself during sleep. An interesting um, fact is that people lose the ability to regulate their body temperature during REM sleep. So if your bedroom is really hot or cold, the abnormal temperature will disrupt your sleep. Sleep serves many functions. Without adequate sleep, people are at risk for many things that decrease quality of life. Sleep deprivation causes significant decreases in performance and alertness. And reducing your nighttime sleep by as little as one and a half hours for just one night could result in a decrease of daytime alertness by as much as 32%. Decreased alertness and excessive daytime sleepiness impair your memory and your cognitive ability, which remember is your ability to think and process information. Sometimes a person can be irritable or even confused due to lack of sleep. Disruption of a bed partner's sleep due to sleep disorders can cause significant problems for the relationship. For example, they may sleep in separate bedrooms, have conflicts, or increase moodiness. Sleep deprivation leads to poor quality of life. You might, for example, be unable to participate in certain activities that require you to pay attention, like going to the movies, seeing your child in a school play, or watching a favorite TV show, because excess sleepiness or falling asleep during these activities keeps you from enjoying them fully. Excessive sleepiness also contributes to a greater than twofold higher risk of getting an occupational injury. This is why many facilities are limiting the amount of hours a nurse can work to no more than 12 hours. The more hours worked, the more fatigue nurses have and the higher risk for patient harm from errors. And another little interesting thing is that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates conservatively that each year drowsy driving is responsible for at least 100,000 automobile crashes, 71,000 injuries, and 1,550 fatalities. According to the Sleep Foundation, being awake for 18 hours straight makes you drive like you have a blood alcohol level of 0.05. For reference, a .08 is considered drunk. If you've been awake for a full 24 hours and drive, say after a night where you just couldn't fall asleep, it's like you have a blood alcohol level of .10. So during REM sleep, most vivid dreams occur. Dreams are necessary for long-term memory and emotional healing. One helpful study strategy then is to review notes and course materials just before bed. It's then cemented better to memory with a good night's sleep. Newborns and infants um, sleep most of the day. About half their sleep is REM. Babies are developing a sleep-wake cycle or circadian rhythm. By age two, toddlers should sleep through the night and take daily naps. They don't want to go to bed because they think they might miss something, so bedtime routines can help with this problem. By middle adulthood, total sleep time begins to decline. They awaken more often and then have trouble getting back to sleep. Sleep efficiency is decreased. Insomnia in the elderly increases the risk of depression, heart disease, body pain, and memory problems. Also, the effects of caffeine last longer in the elderly, making it even harder to fall asleep. So what affects sleep? Well, each patient is unique, so keep that in mind, and there's a lot of factors that affect sleep. So let's start with illness. Factors that affect um, sleep regarding illness include pain, discomfort, anxiety, difficulty breathing, nausea, or mood problems. Medications, um, they might decrease REM sleep, and they can cause sleep problems in the form of the medication of stimulants, but some help the sleep cycle, like sleeping pills, so it depends on the medication. Um, developmental factors include aging. As you age, it's harder to fall or stay asleep. Less time is spent sleeping, and sleep is less sound. We want to discourage the use of sleep meds in the elderly because they can cause significant confusion. Motivation also affects sleep. Is there a desire to be awake and alert that helps the patient overcome the sleepiness? Or do they just want to sleep and sleep and sleep? Cultural considerations include privacy, quiet environment, and bedtime rituals. Lifestyle and habits affect, affecting sleep include working odd hours, reverse shifts, and shift changes, and this can all affect the circadian rhythm. So can unaccustomed heavy work and late night activities, also sports and TV. Exercise helps to promote restful sleep, but not if it's too close to 
bedtime, so keep that in mind. Um, alcohol, smoking, and caffeine interfere with sleep, as does large, heavy meals within three to four hours of sleep. Um, environmental impacts on sleep include being in a new environment, loud or no noise environments, ventilation, the light, temperature, and the bed. Is the bed comfortable? Noise decreases the REM cycle and can lead to psychological stress, which is um, insomnia and decreased REM equals stress. All right, so some sleep disorders we'll go over next. Insomnia is described as difficulty falling and staying asleep or waking up too early and not being able to go back to sleep. Sleep apnea, specifically central sleep apnea, is decreased ventilation effort and decreased blood oxygen saturations. Obstructive sleep apnea is when the soft tissue of the throat blocks airflow, making breathing difficult. Narcolepsy is uncontrollable episodes of falling asleep. Sometimes the person falls to the ground when they suddenly fall asleep, and this is called cataplexy. Um, some examples of circadian rhythm disorders are jet lag and shift work disorder, like we talked about at the start of the presentation. And then parasomnias are described as activities that are normal during wakefulness, but they're not normal during sleep. So, for example, sleepwalking, night terrors, um, and enuresis would be another one of those. And then sleep-related movement disorders are things like restless leg syndrome where you just, um, your legs are just jumping in the bed uncontrollably. So as always, we begin the nursing process with assessment. Information can be obtained from the patient or anyone close to the patient if necessary. It's important to obtain a detailed sleep history. If there are any red flags, assess this in more detail. And the points here list more detailed assessments that you can do as a nurse assessing your patient. So it's going to be necessary in some instances to test for sleep disorders. These tests require a provider order and generally are testing for sleep apnea, whether the sleep apnea is central or obstructive. Remember from the sleep disorders slide that sleep apnea is when a person has soft tissue blocking their airway or stops breathing while they're sleeping. Symptoms of sleep apnea are snoring, stopping breathing during sleeping, and daytime fatigue or tiredness. For a sleep study, the patient's attached to cardiac monitors, brain monitors, and respiratory monitors, and a pulse oximeter while they sleep, and the measurements are taken to decide if the patient needs a, sleep, a CPAP at night to keep their airway open while they sleep. So after an assessment is performed, data is analyzed, and nursing diagnoses are formed. Remember to put these in PEZ format, that's problem, etiology, and signs and symptoms. Then we write our patient-specific goals, and remember those need to be SMART. Natural nursing interventions are listed here. These are what you, as the nurse, can do to help your patient meet their goals. Pharmacological approaches include over-the-counter things like Benadryl, Tylenol PM, or melatonin. And then there's prescribed prescriptions, um, which are hypnotics or sleeping pills, or benzodiazepine drugs such as lorazepam. So pay attention to this slide and look at different things we can do for our patients to help them sleep better. And then evaluation looks at the specific goals in nursing interventions to see if the interventions were effective and if the patient goals were met. If not, revamp and try again. And that concludes our presentation on sleep and rest. Thanks for watching and have a great day.